tonight on Cronkite News why Hispanics and Indigenous students have the highest rate of school absences. Plus, Special Counsel Robert Hur testified today facing backlash from both Democrats and Republicans over his investigation into President Biden's classified documents case. And a new attraction at the Phoenix Raceway, how it's bringing together Arizona's Latin community. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News. I'm Sydney Whitty. And I'm Jacob Jones. Thank you for joining us. Tom Horn was down at the state capitol this afternoon to deliver his State of Education address. The superintendent of public instruction says his only goal in the last year was to help schools raise the academic performance of the students. Horn noted that teacher retention was one of the biggest challenges facing schools, with a net loss of more than 3,300 students a year. The superintendent says raising teacher salaries and giving teachers more support, especially when it comes to discipline, will help with the teacher shortage. Other areas Horn wants to focus on is career readiness for graduates, helping failing schools and reducing red tape to help schools be more efficient. Now to a new report from Dados, which finds Hispanics and Indigenous students have the highest rate of school absences. Cronkite News reporter Roxanne De La Rosa explored why this is happening and how school authorities are trying to find a solution. There's absolutely no reason that Hispanic students can't be in school just as much as anybody else. State Superintendent Tom Horn shares his thoughts on the latest Arizona Department of Education report. Horn attributes this issue to the ongoing effects of the pandemic and believes that part of the solution is to hold students accountable. We need to bring back traditional discipline so students know there's cons there are consequences for misbehavior. Yeah. Uh, suspension, expulsion, uh, in, in class suspension sometimes if it's not serious. According to the report, more than 67% of Latino students are chronically absent from school. Indigenous students came in with the second highest rate at more than 55%. More than 80% of students in the Roosevelt School District are Latinos, making it one of the school districts with the highest number of Latino students. Roosevelt School District Superintendent Dani Portillo understands the Latino community is our sense of family. We know we honor our families and our families are number one. And the struggles both Latino students and their parents face. And sometimes we find with our older students that um, when there's situations where they need to stay home to take care of a sibling, or in some families, uh, the parent might have an, a job where they don't get paid sick time. So. Portillo says having supportive teachers plays a huge role in students being in school and they are seeing the impact. We actually have seen a reduction in uh, chronic absenteeism. So an improvement in the, uh, the number of days that students are present in school. And, and we're excited about that. In Phoenix, Roxanne de la Rosa, Cronkite News. According to Superintendent Portillo, the Roosevelt School District has a family liaison on each campus to support families. Raul Grill Halva and other U.S. House members are asking for $3 billion for FEMA's shelter and services program. The money would go toward local aid groups who use this program to assist migrants that have been released by Border Patrol and are awaiting immigration hearings. Without more funding, aid groups says services like short-term shelters and transportation will stop by the end of March in southern Arizona. Phoenix aid groups could see the same issue in June. Meanwhile, a temporary freeze on a controversial immigration law in Texas has just been extended by the U.S. Supreme Court. The law was supposed to go into effect tomorrow and would allow state police to arrest people suspected of entering the country illegally. The governor of Texas signed it into law last year. But the Biden administration asked the Supreme Court to block it earlier this month. As of now, the freeze is in effect until Monday. Today, former special counsel Robert Hur defended his investigation into President Joe Biden's handling of classified documents. His report, which found Biden willfully retained classified information, but described him as a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory, did not lead to any charges against the president. But the hearing is shining light on the differences in former President Donald Trump's classified documents case, which led to an indictment. Republicans are pressing Hur on, on his decision to not also prosecute Biden despite evidence that he possessed classified documents. 
while Democrats are going after her for his comments about Biden's memory, saying it was unnecessary. Today, her defended his decision. He also said he didn't remember finding enemy classified material in his home after his vice presidency. And he didn't remember anything about how classified documents about Afghanistan made their way into his garage. My assessment in the report about the relevance of the president's memory was necessary and accurate and fair. Her formally resigned from the Justice Department before today's testimony. Coming up next, high-speed internet some might take for granted. But many tribal residents actually lack the technology. Now broadband is coming to rural areas in Arizona thanks to government funding. It's been over five years since I used a computer. We'll look at how access to the internet may not be enough for some tribal communities. And our streak of beautiful weather could soon be coming to an end. Your forecast is coming up next. ASU's one and only student-run radio station, Blaze Radio, provides students with opportunities to cover a variety of topics. From music, this is Sun City Garage, to sports coverage, against the Brewers in his last outing, he went like, to news, the bill also gives parents the ability to see, and entertainment updates. Blaze Radio offers a fun environment to gain valuable broadcast experience. To find out more, visit blazeradioonline.com. As journalists at Cronkite News, we report on stories that matter to you by focusing on the local impact. We dig deeper and work tirelessly to keep you informed. Live in Wickerburg. Live in Los Angeles. In Cleveland. In Washington. In Louisville. From Jerusalem. Live in Philadelphia. From around the world to right here in Phoenix. At Cronkite News, we report the facts and stick to the truth. For many people living in rural or tribal communities, accessing the internet might not be easy. In tribal lands, almost 28% of Americans lack high-speed internet, compared to less than 2% of Americans in urban areas, according to the FCC. The Biden administration is providing funds to change that. But as Cronkite News reporter Maria Stobbs found out, better connectivity may not be enough. This construction project on the Tohono O'odham Nation is bringing the 21st century to a rural part of Arizona. Here on the reservation, our connection with internet is kind of sparse, so it's here and there. The Tohono O'odham Utility Authority is laying down a fiber optic network to provide high-speed internet to members of the nation. It's thanks to a $10 million grant from the Department of Agriculture. We are moving more towards the technology era and we don't want to get left behind. Via Chin resident Tonya Joaquin says the high-speed internet will improve her family's education and health care. We live about, what, two hours, two and a half hours away from town. Um, my son will have um, telemed, so he sees a doctor out at the Phoenix Children's Hospital. We don't have to drive there. We have a home visit on the internet. We're able to educate and teach, you know, our tribal membership of all ages. Kristen Johnson manages operations for the tribe's main internet service provider. She says broadband will provide opportunities for economic development. Whether they're basket weavers, they're dressmakers, you know, they harvest or whatever they do, they're able to put that on the internet and be able to sell it and be, you know, help themselves out. Biden administration officials have been touring rural and native communities like this one to learn their needs and assess the impact of their funding. Broadband is like water. It's an essential public utility that should be affordable and accessible to everyone. 
While members of the nation have welcomed the investment in broadband infrastructure, there are fundamental barriers that prevent its full implementation in Native American communities. High on the list, access to a computer or a smartphone at home and an understanding of how to use them. We have elders that they don't even know what internet is. Brian Fickett is the general manager of the agency that provides internet and cell service to the tribe. These folks will be able to connect at home just like they would um, off the reservation. Here at the Tahana Otham Community College, a computer literacy training program provides 10 members from each district with education on how to use the internet. Your subject line right here, and then your greeting, hello. Lessons can be as simple as sending an email. Anselmo Ramon is one of the leaders of the program. We trained them from the very basics of the components, moved them up to the features on the keyboard, move them up to turning it like on and off. There are students of all ages here. Some are familiar with the technology. It's been over five years since I used a computer, so this is really helping me to learn more. Others are starting fresh. It's really new to me. Everything's new to me. I've never been on the computers. Funding for the computer training course lasts only two years. So Anselmo Ramon has devised a plan to grow computer literacy throughout his tribal nation. It relies on students passing on their newfound knowledge. So in Train to Trainer, we want to train 10 people. In turn, we want those people to train another family member or a friend or a coworker. It's a practical solution because tribal members understand before they can run with high-speed internet, they have to first learn how to walk. I'm Maria Stobbs for Cronkite News. Arizona has been awarded close to a billion dollars in funding for broadband. The federal government is continuing to accept applications from underserved communities until May 14th. Back here in the valley last week brought us some rain. Could we be seeing the same thing this week? I really hope so. Athena Kehoe is in the Weather Center with this week's forecast. That's right. It was a beautiful day today, and it still is. Right now it's 73 degrees, and the rest of the next few hours still look very nice out. So if you have any plans this evening, it will be very comfortable outside. And the lows for tomorrow, 52 at Phoenix. So again, not too bad. Tucson not too far off at 49 degrees, Yuma 58. However, the northern part of the state will be a bit colder. 21 in Flagstaff, 22 Grand Canyon, 37 in Sedona. And the highs tomorrow throughout the valley are very promising, 77 in Phoenix, and that's actually the average. So we are right on track when it comes to that average. And for the rest of the valley, 76 in Phoenix, 72 in Fountain Hills, 75 down in Chandler. So again, a lot of just 70s tomorrow. So not much complaining there. However, Friday is when we are going to see a bit of a cool down. As you can see here Friday morning, Flagstaff and Gary Canyon are going to see a little bit of a mix of snow and rain. So that is just where we're going to see a little bit of activity, especially in the northern part of the state. And if you are planning on going to any spring training tomorrow, Thursday, beautiful weather, high of 80 on Thursday. Friday, again, is when we are going to see a bit of a cool down with a high of 68. Throughout the rest of the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, the high is 74 on Sunday. Throughout the rest of the week is when we're going to see those clouds stay partially. And Wednesday, the high is 82. So after we get past Friday, we're going to see it start to warm up again. In the Cronkite News Weather Center, I'm Athena Kehoe. I'm Jesse Broaders. And I'm Jack Pearson with a preview of tonight's Cronkite Sports Report. Coming up after the break, if you're a fan of Malcolm in the Middle, you might recognize this actor and now NASCAR driver, how Frankie Munez is making connections with kids in his community. What Cronkite News means to me is opportunity. We do news right at Cronkite News, serving a community ethically, honestly, and truthfully. And we can provide a necessarily different angle, different voice for those people that really need it. The students, they have a lot of passion for journalism. I get to do a lot of stories about the Hispanic community. And we have access to cover all of these sorts of events and get media coverage of all these different personalities and athletes, and that's just a huge thing. But it's also a chance for people here to be humanized. Individuals of all walks of life. Cronkite News will help take the next generation of journalists onto their next careers. I am old enough to remember Walter Cronkite. We're putting a lot of pride on his name because we are practicing a lot of the, the things that he did. I think he'd be smiling from ear to ear. 
I. 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 We are all night. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications Phoenix Sports Bureau provides students with hands-on learning experiences and opportunities in sports journalism. From covering local high schools, colleges, and the pros, students get the opportunity to go live from our Facebook shows covering local, collegiate, and pro sports in the Valley. From digital reporting, broadcast, social media, and producing, there's opportunities for all. For more, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. Welcome back, I'm Jesse Broaders. And I'm Jack Pearson with tonight's Cronkite Sports Report. And we are still unpacking all that happened during NASCAR's big weekend at Phoenix Raceway. While the big race was on Sunday, there was the Xfinity Series race on Saturday. Yeah, and it was quite an exciting one. It went all the way to overtime with a few crashes that played a critical role in the outcome. Fate was truly on the side of Chandler Smith all race. At lap 143, Smith triggered a 12-car pileup that wiped out several drivers from the race but Smith came out unscathed. Number 81 managed to get into second place, but looked as if there was no way he could win as Justin Allgaier had a three second lead and was clearly going to run away with the victory. But with five laps to go, Allgaier blew a back tire, crashing into the wall, giving way for Chandler Smith to take home the checkered flag. What a finish. I mean, we were dominating a little bit there for a bit, so. Uh, to be as good as he was there at the end and something like that happened, it's heartbreaking. So I hate it for those guys, but um, it just wasn't meant to be for him. And it's easy for me to say that sitting up here um, with, with the trophy going home with me tonight. Yeah, what a fun race that was. Meanwhile, NASCAR continues to build their fan base. And this year, Phoenix Raceway offered more cultural events. Crockett News reporter Dorian Zavala has more on how the raceway brought a Latin flair to the NASCAR fan experience. With a large Latin community here in the Valley, NASCAR and Phoenix Raceway debuted a new attraction this past weekend at the track. The Viva La Fiesta exhibit was in full display over the weekend, embracing the Latino culture and introducing it to the NASCAR community. Midway, like Viva La Fiesta, we had a whole uh, fiesta area where you had um, uh, his, celebrating the Latin culture, uh, had uh, mariachi bands, had uh, all kinds of activations like Lucho Libre um, that was there as well. And then we did a partnership with Sophisticated Few and had lowriders even out there. I love it, man. Uh, it's just a whole different vibe that you feel, you know what I mean? We're bringing NASCAR together, which is a big group, you know what I mean? NASCAR is huge, so they're doing it for everybody, so everyone can enjoy it. Yeah, have a good time. Viva La Fiesta stage included everything from cultural dancing, live music, and even Q&As with Mexican NASCAR driver Daniel Suarez and players from Phoenix Rising. All were ecstatic to take part in the festivities. I think it's great, especially over, around here where, where we're standing right now. There's a lot of like Hispanic influence with food and music and stuff. So especially here in Arizona with the big Hispanic population, I think it's important to, to integrate the, the Hispanic community into, into the Phoenix Raceway. NASCAR fans got to enjoy some of the most popular activities within the Latin culture over the weekend. And Phoenix Raceway hopes to grow these events in the future. From Avondale, Dorian Zavala, Cronkite News. Speaking of the Xfinity race, Jack, do you remember the show Malcolm in the Middle? I think I remember a little bit, but it's been a while since I tuned in. Same for me, but the actor from the show, Frankie Munez, is now a NASCAR driver. That's right, and, and he also hosted one of the community events during race week. Our Sam Valenti has more on the impact the actor had on some young fans. The Sam Garcia Library in Avondale played host to Storytime with Frankie Munez. The event was part of Phoenix Raceway's community give back efforts during race week. It meant a lot to the actor and current Xfinity Series driver to connect with children. I was super excited. You know, if I can come here and they get to meet a race car driver and get a story read and it puts a smile on their face, like, I, I want to do that all the time. Chantel Carlson is the Senior Director of Business Operations at Phoenix Raceway, and she thinks it's important to engage with young race fans. We want to make sure that we are telling the story of NASCAR, telling the story of Phoenix Raceway out into the community, and that we are sharing our sport with the, with the future. NASCAR Week also brought more people to Avenue. Brenda Soto works as a library paraprofessional and she noted that the library and other places benefit from race fans coming through town. It also helps us too with 
uh, with families and, and uh, new people, new uh, patrons coming into the library. Soto says that the library plans to continue partnering with Phoenix Raceway in the future, bringing more engaging events to the community. In Avondale, Sam Valenti, Cronkite News. We talk about NASCAR all day, but let's switch gears now. The ASU women's hockey team recently clinched back-to-back -back WWCHL titles and will head to St. Louis to compete in the national tournament. Really talented team there, Jesse. Incredibly talented, and they showcased a lot of improvement over the past year. And as Cronkite News reporter Trey Matthews tells us, there was one player in particular who instantly made an impact in her first season. Arizona State's women's hockey team is heading back to the ACHA National Tournament for the second year in a row. However, going into the season, they lost a lot of firepower in their offense because a pair of their leading goal scorers graduated. Luckily, junior transfer Anita Fleming helped fill the void and led the Sun Devils in goals in her first year with the program. I definitely thought I had something to prove and I wanted to just have a good, fun year of hockey. Uh, I didn't have too high of expectations as far as the hockey side, but I definitely wanted to work hard and see what I wanted to do. It's definitely a huge confidence booster, but I definitely wouldn't have been able to do it without my line mates and my teammates. The Sun Devils went undefeated in conference play for the first time in program history. They improved their goals for rating from 100 to 117. They also lowered their goals against rating from last season. Head coach Lindsey Ellis credits Fleming's versatility as a big reason why. Anita has been such a you know, key part of our team in every single part of our game, you know, from five on five to special teams. And, you know, she always finds a way to gain possession of that puck. And, um, you know, she has high energy and compete all the time, no matter it's practice or a game. So, you know, there's, there's really nothing more you can ask for as a coach. The number 10 Sun Devils will play their first national tournament game on March 13th against number three Adrian College where they hope to see better results compared to last year. In Tempe, Trey Matthews, Cronkite News. We'll keep our eye on the women's hockey team in their national tournament run. Finally, tonight we bring you the AIA Robotic State Championships. Yeah, two-time defending champions Desert Ridge High School had the honor of hosting this year's event on their own soil, Jesse. Besides winning the last two robotic state championships, Desert Ridge placed 10th in last year's VEX Robotics World Championship. This year, the Jaguars were looking to three-peat for the state title. In a final best of two matches, the Mechanical Jaguars teamed up with the independent team Aurora. The pairings won both matches to obtain the Arizona State title as robotics champions, so it was indeed a three-peat for Desert Ridge. Jesse, can we call this a dynasty so far? I mean, it seems like these guys can't lose. Yeah, they've been killing it so far, and love to see how they do at World Championships, but that's it. For Cronkite News, I'm Jesse Broaders. And I'm Jack Pearson. We'll send it back over to Jacob and Sydney at the desk. Thanks, guys. Well, when we return, a daring rescue. Jacob, not only was the rescue daring, but it was a bit unusual. Coming up, the adorable dog that was saved by some very brave people after this quick break. What Cronkite News means to me is opportunity. We do news right at Cronkite News, serving a community ethically, honestly, and truthfully. And we can provide a necessarily different angle, different voice for those people that really need it. The students, they have a lot of passion for journalism. I get to do a lot of stories about the Hispanic community. And we have access to cover all of these sorts of events and get media coverage of all these different personalities and athletes, and that's just a huge thing. But it's also a chance for people here to be humanized. Individuals of all walks of life. Cronkite News will help take the next generation of journalists onto their next careers. I am old enough to remember Walter Cronkite. We're putting a lot of pride on his name because we are practicing a lot of the, the things that he did. I think he'd be smiling from ear to ear. I. 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 We are Cronkite. At Cronkite News, learn to work behind the camera for studio production. Our students spend time learning the ins and outs of all that it takes to run a newscast. From setting up the studio to building exciting graphics, studio production provides a job for everyone. Whether it be running audio, technical directing, or directing the newscast, students can experience the action behind the scenes. 
join our team today. Welcome back. NASA's Crew-7 returned to Mother Earth earlier today. That's right, Sydney. They returned on the SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule, and it was quite the sight to see. A beautiful sight. As you can see on your screen, we have Dragon Splashdown. The four-person crew splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico. They had been on the International Space Station since late August, preparing for a future mission to the moon and eventually Mars. And finally tonight, officers in one Kentucky town responded to an unusual search and rescue call. That's right, Sydney. They were called to rescue Waylon the dog. It happened in Jamestown, Kentucky, which is south of Lexington. Waylon somehow became stuck on a bluff that's nearly 200 feet tall. A rescuer used a rope to get down to Waylon and then bring the dog back up to safety. Waylon was eventually returned to his owner. That's it for Cronkite News. Thanks for joining us.